Good morning. So this is a uh, week 13. So it's the last week. So today we will be doing what we might consider the pinnacle of our achievement in this course. This is singular value decomposition, SVD for short. This will bring together almost everything that we've learned so far into one cohesive uh, unit. And uh, that is quite satisfying and it's the right place to stop. Even though we are stopping at this point, many advanced courses in linear algebra, especially when it is applied to data science, actually starts at this point. So today we will be doing singular value decomposition SVB. we will see how it works and the properties and applications and one of the applications will be pca principal component analysis and for some historical reason these are treated as though they are different things and they use different locations symbols etc but they are actually the same thing through pca svd is very important for uh, data science so we will see that part also and finally we will see that svd can be used to define something called a pseudo inverse and that will complete the connection or among the four fundamental subspaces of a matrix and that is intellectually a very satisfying moment so i will strive to share that beauty and elegance of that picture with you and that will be the last slide of the course so let's start with uh, eigenvalue decomposition there are some limitations for one thing we can apply this only to a square matrix so in our case for computer science and data science our matrices are are not going to be square it's going to be horribly non-square and you know we cannot apply it the basic definition of eigenvalue decomposition or eigenvalues and eigenvectors is that a times an eigenvector is uh, an eigenvalue times the, the same vector so it's a scale version of the vector that results from the transformation implemented by the matrix a now if you arrange these uh, vectors in uh, columns of a matrix s and if you arrange the eigenvalues as the diagonal elements of another matrix then we can rewrite this definition as a matrix equation a is equal to s lambda this is always true because that comes from the definition it is true by definition now on top of that if we know that s is invertible which means that we have enough eigenvectors that are linearly independent in that case we can invert it and then we can write a is equal to s lambda s inverse and that is eigenvalue decomposition and this works especially well for real and symmetric matrices because we are guaranteed to have eigenvectors that are orthogonal to each other when you get an orthonormal matrix we typically call that a q and its inverse which takes the, the place of a s inverse would be just a transpose that is a property of uh, orthonormal matrices so we can write a is equal to q lambda q transpose which is the spectral theorem so eigenvalue decomposition a has to be square it has to be real and a transpose is equal to a it has to be symmetric so that's when we have good eigenvalue decomposition of the kind in uh, the spectral theorem but for any general matrix a where it is not square it's got m rows and n columns we would like to have a similar decomposition that has the same form so we would like to write a is equal to u some matrix some orthogonal matrix orthonormal sigma a matrix that is diagonal and v transpose where v is an orthonormal matrix again u and v are orthogonal sigma is a diagonal matrix so this is pretty close to the spectral theorem it's just that instead of q and q you have two different matrices that's probably okay so close enough to a spectral theorem this is what we would like to have now notice that uh, sigma here is not a square matrix u and v are square matrices but sigma will have the same size as a if you can decompose any matrix especially a data matrix then what we will get is the sigma matrix it's got main diagonal elements not zero everything else is uh, zero but it's the same size m rows and n column as the as the original matrix so lots of zeros inside and u is an m by n matrix and v is an n by n matrix soon we will see that it can be um, made smaller by considering that a has a rank of r then only r values inside sigma will be non-zero so we can actually take a small r by r and we can call that a sigma hat so it's a small version of a sigma and in order to make the multiplication work then u will turn out to be a non-square matrix so that is not an orthonormal matrix yet it's got columns that are actually orthogonal but not a square matrix so it's not an orthonormal matrix so now let's just look at uh, how the multiplication works in the case of full svd here i have an n by n here 
the transpose of that will also be n by n this n and that n will cancel off so this product is going to be m by n and then this m and this m will cancel off so the final product is going to be m by n which is the size of a and in the case of uh, the hatted version what we will call economical or smaller svd i have r by r inside v is n by r so v transpose is going to be r by n so this r and that r will cancel and this r R and that R will cancel. So what is left would be M by N. So that also works. The dimensions actually work out fine. So hatred version is called the smaller economical ver version. But it's important to know that this economical version is not an approximation. It's not an approximate equation. It is still completely accurate. Now let's take an example. So let's look at a matrix that's got same elements in the diagonal and one off diagonal element. This is actually very similar to a shear matrix. What it does is uh, pretty much identical to what a shear matrix would do. It's a triangular matrix. What are the eigenvalues? It's got two eigenvalues. They are the same. Square root of 3 by 2 because those are the diagonal elements. Determinant will be this guy times this guy minus this guy times this guy. That is a 0 because there's one zero there. So it's going to be that. And that means I have square root of 3 by 2 as the eigenvalue appearing twice. Eigenvector is 0, 1 and that happens only once. So it's got algebraic multiplicity of 2, geometric multiplicity of 1. So this is not diagonalizable and is a shear matrix actually. And this is a bad situation in uh, eigenvalue decomposition. We will get stumped here. We would have to stop. There's nothing more we can do here. But SVD, we can actually perform on this one. We can write a, this matrix is some u times a sigma times v transpose and it will turn out that that is the way it is. u is a, a matrix like that, that is a orthogonal, it's actually a rotation matrix, sines and cosines of uh, angle 60 in there and sigma is a scaling matrix, so v transpose is another rotation. If you look at v transpose, that is a rotation through an angle 30 and sigma is a scaling, it scales the x values by 1.5, 3 by 2 and y values by half. So that's what it does. And u is a clockwise rotation through an angle 60. So let's start looking at these things. Here we are actually dealing with a 2 by 2 matrix so that we can visualize this in R2. But in general, it doesn't have to have the same number of rows and columns. It could be something that takes vectors in R2 and gives you vectors in R3 or R4. So shear matrix, what it does, it takes the first uh, unit vector, the first column of uh, the identity matrix, and gives you a transformed version of minus root 3 by 2 minus 1. That is the first column of the shear matrix. And the second column says that it will take the second unit vector 0, 1 and will give you a transformed version Q2 triple prime to be that. And if you look at it, what it does to Q2 is just a scaling. It makes it a little smaller but in the same direction. So that is an, actually an eigenvector with the eigenvalue square root of uh, 3 by 2. What it does to a unit square, if you think about it, is to transform that into this uh, parallelogram. So it is like shear. It squashed the unit square a little bit and then uh, shear it downward but instead of a pure shear it also scaled it by a little bit so it's a scaling and shear but a shear matrix nonetheless now let's think about the decomposition a is equal to u sigma v transpose so v transpose will apply first so that is a rotation what it does to a unit uh, vector along the x-axis is to rotate it counterclockwise by 30 degrees does the same thing with uh, the other unit vector the blue one so 30 degrees and and the matrix is what it does to the unit vectors and you can just write down the matrix actually it was given to you is uh, square root of 3 by 2 half minus half square root of uh, 3 by 2 and that is actually a rotation by pi by 6 30 degrees counterclockwise which means all the vectors whose uh, tips fall on this unit circle will get transformed to other vectors whose tips still fall on the unit circle but at different points so all the vectors in the first quadrant between here and here will end up between here and here the next one is a scaling so what it does is to take the first vector q1 and scale it up by a factor one and a half and the second unit vector gets scaled down by a factor half so it basically takes a unit uh, circle squashes it vertically and stretches it horizontally now if you think about the vectors 
that were rotated by V transpose. They are like the shadows of the vectors here and uh, here and they get squashed down to this point and this point. So in the original quadrant everything that was between here and here in the unit circle now are on the ellipse. The tips are on the ellipse between this point and this point. So that's what's happening to those vectors. That is the action of uh, V transpose followed by sigma. There is one more rotation that is coming up clockwise rotation that takes uh, this vector u1 and rotates it and brings it along this major axis of the ellipse. So it takes the whole ellipse and rotates it down by pi by 3 which is 60 degrees in the clockwise direction. So what that means is that my original vector that was q1 that got transformed to some other rotated version and then squashed down to this shadow of the red vector here that is now going to end up here because the whole thing got rotated and that angle from here to here that is 60 degrees. Similarly my original q2 which went somewhere here on the unit circle and then squashed down to this point here and that gets rotated to this point so that it ends up back on the y-axis. Now if you think about it in the original uh, unit circle the vectors whose tips were between this point and this point in the first quadrant now their tips are going to be between this and this. So that is the action of the matrix A now decomposed into three different matrices and if you multiply all three surely you're going to get, get A back. So, so that is a, that's what the decomposition does and tells you the vectors whose tips were on the unit circle there are now with their tips on the ellipse here the pulsating ellipse there now just to summarize what's happening here if you just apply blindly just a matrix directly and try to figure out what it does it takes the unit vectors and then gives you some ellipse as shown here and if you decompose it then you can see that it's actually a rotation followed by a scaling and then followed by one more rotation much like what we saw in the spectral theorem interpretation of, uh, of a real symmetric matrix but this is for a general matrix that cannot be diagonalized. Now remember this is a 2 by 2 matrix A but it doesn't have to be 2 by 2 it could be M by N. So it would take a vector in Rn and take it to some other space Rm but still it's going to actually end up on uh, an ellipsoid and singular value decomposition will tell you the properties of the ellipsoid. So it's much more general than EVD. Now let's talk about how it does its magic. What we want is this. We have a mapping matrix that takes vectors from Rn and gives you vectors in Rm. It's a mapping from Rn to Rm and let's say the rank is R. The mapping from the row space of uh, this matrix to the column space of the same matrix is a one-to-one -one mapping. Any vector in the row space will give you a unique vector in the column space. So that is a one-to-one -one mapping. That's because if x is in the, the row space and let's say it's a non-zero vector in the row space, then that is a linear combination of the columns of A. And as we saw from the very first chapter, I believe, linear combination is unique. You cannot get two different uh, vectors by taking the same linear combination and all linear combinations of the columns of A will find itself in the column space because that's the definition of the column. This is a set of all possible linear combinations. So one to one on to mapping as it is called. Now what we are trying to do is to find a basis in the row space. Suppose we can find a basis in the row space. Now that is not very difficult to find. A basis would be just uh, the pivot rows. I just take the pivot rows and take, take their transposes. So the, the column vectors. That would be a basis for the the row space and you want an orthonormal basis not just any basis even that is not very difficult because once you have a basis all you have to do is to run gram schmidt and you will get orthonormal basis so that we can do so starting from the pivot rows we can actually get an orthonormal basis if you take any one of the, these vectors from the orthonormal basis so vi will be one vector one basis vector of the row space it will end up as a unique vector in the column space so you will get some set of vectors in the column space but there's no guarantee that those vectors are going to be orthonormal basis of the column space there's no guarantee we'll just get some vectors so what we want to have is an orthonormal basis in the column space so let's take stock of what we have so we have a applying on the orthonormal basis vectors of the row space and we know that we will get some vector u as a unit vector and sigma is a is a length of that vector so every single vector 
that you have in uh, the row space and how many of them do we have it's as many as the rank because the dimension of the row space is the rank we have r vectors standing here and applying a on them we're going to get r vectors in the column space and we can make sure that they are normal with their unit vectors called the normalization factors sigmas and exactly as we did in the case of eigenvalues we can put those sigmas as the, the diagonal elements of a matrix if you expand this guy you will get this card. So this is possible. So we can always write a v hat. I'm going to write v hat rather than v because I don't have n vectors here. I have only r vectors here. So it's a smaller version. A v hat is u hat and then sigma hat because this is an r by r matrix now. We would like this u to be an orthonormal basis of uh, the column space. There's no guarantee that it's going to be that. What we want is orthonormality on the column space side. The normality part, the fact that they are unit vectors Vectors, it's very easy to do. We can just normalize it and take out the normalization factor and call it a sigma. So that is easy. But getting them to be orthogonal to each other, that part is not easy. We already have orthonormal basis in the input side, in the domain, in Rn, in the row space, the space where x vectors live. And these vectors do span the row space because there's a definition of the basis vectors. Now, suppose we actually want not just a basis for the row space, but for the whole domain all of rn so what's left in the domain would be the null space so remember in our picture on the left hand side we have the row space and the null space and if you have the basis for the row space and we add the basis for the null space also then we get the basis for everything okay so we can actually complete the basis by taking the basis for the null space also and then v will be an n by n matrix because we've got n linearly independent vectors those are the basis vectors for Rn and we can choose them to be orthonormal and that is possible. So that means V transpose is going to be V inverse and we would like to have the same thing for the output side, the codomain, the column space and the space containing it. So that's what we would like to have. We have the transformation Ax equal to B which will take vectors in the row space to vectors in the column space and the right hand side is Rm that is all possible vectors on the output side and Rn on the input side the green side that is all possible input vectors so this is what we have this is what we had right after we did our four fundamental subspaces some time ago all vectors in the row space will end up in the column space all zero vectors will of course go to the zero vector here because a matrix times zero vector is going to give you zero and on top of that everything in the null space will also go to the zero vector that is the definition of the null space we can take the example of the xy plane as the row space and uh, the z axis as null space but most vectors in r3 are not going to be in the xy plane nor on the z axis it's going to be somewhere else so those vectors are actually just linear combinations of uh, vectors in the null space and the row space so we have to worry about that in a second but what we already have is an orthonormal basis for the row space which we can always find because we just take uh, the pivot rows as the basis and then orthonormalize it using the gram schmidt process we'll get an orthonormal basis there so that we have and we would like to have an orthonormal basis here also it'll go to some vectors here but we don't know that uh, if those guys are actually orthonormal basis for the column space now if you complete the basis in the null space which we can do by finding the complete solution to ax equal to b the the free variables etc then we can complete the basis on the input side the domain rn so we have n vectors there similarly we can complete the basis on the left null space and that way you can get a full basis for rm also that would give you the u matrix so this is what we want now like i said most vectors in the input side are not in the row space nor in the null space so that we have to keep in mind so what we already have is some basis for rn and some other some other vectors in r m and this equation anything that is in the rn will go to the column space and we know now that v is orthonormal because we completed the basis and it's uh, an n by n matrix and it's orthonormal it contains the basis vectors for the, the row space and the basis vectors for the null space which is a complete basis so that means we can multiply both sides by v inverse which is the same as v transpose because it's orthonormal so we have an expression for a like that so that means if you just take the transpose of that what i'll get is a transpose this is the, the product of uh, transposes in the reverse order so v transpose transpose and u transpose now if we can actually satisfy our 
requirement that we want u to be an orthonormal matrix, then we can say that u transpose is actually u inverse. So if that is true, if this is true, then we can take this equation, the red equation, and multiply the blue equation by it. So multiply on the left. So a transpose a v is going to be equal to this expression here, v sigma u inverse times u sigma. So what do we have in here? If this matrix is actually orthonormal, then that is just i. And then you get sigma transpose sigma, which is just sigma square because it's a diagonal matrix. So what do we get? We get a transpose a v is equal to v sigma square. So that is what we will get if we ensure that u transpose is equal to u inverse. If that is our requirement, and if you can satisfy it, then we will get this equation. If you look at that equation, what's, what's that telling you? In order to see that equation better, let's call A transpose A by a new letter B. So if you have the eigenvalue decomposition of B, then you have B times some matrix, the eigenvector matrix is equal to the eigenvector matrix times the eigenvalues of B. So compare this guy with this. What it is saying is that V is, is actually the matrix of eigenvectors of a transpose A and sigma square is actually the matrix of eigenvalues of A transpose A. So that's what it is telling you. So VI, each vector in the matrix V is an eigenvector of A transpose A. Remember A transpose A is our gram matrix. It's coming up again here with an eigenvalue that is equal to sigma square, sigma I square. So that way we can actually compute all the V's and all the sigmas. So it's already there. So we found our special basis in the input side such that it will go to uh, an orthonormal basis on the output side that we implemented by insisting that this be true, I mean this be equal to identity matrix. And similarly, if you actually want to compute ui, what you will do is to take aa transpose and basically do the multiplication the other way and you will get the eigenvalues equal to sigma i transpose again, and sigma i square again, and you will get ui to be the eigenvectors of a a transpose. So what is important to know is that a transpose a and a a transpose have the same eigenvalues, the non-zero eigenvalues are the same. So one of them will have some number of uh, zeros, the other one may not, but the non-zero eigenvalues are the same. This can be proven fairly easily. Now we are going to say that we found sigma i square as the eigenvalues of uh, A transpose A, the gram matrix, and we're going to take the positive square root as the values in sigma. Sigma A is a positive square root of the eigenvalues of A transpose A or A transpose because they are the same. So what we have is a matrix that is a uh, m by n is a general matrix. It doesn't have full rank, so rank is actually less than m or n, and we we constructed the basis for the input space and the basis for the output space will be just the basis of the, the column space union with the basis of the left null space. Started from the basis for the input space and then we did the SVD and we got a full basis for the output space Rm. That would turn out to be some vectors, the first R vectors actually, would be the basis for the column space. The next M minus R vectors will be the basis for the left null space. So that's what we will have. So R matrix A can be written as a matrix U which is a basis for the output space codomain Rm. So it is an M by M matrix and that has a U hat that is just the basis for the column space and then there are M minus R columns that are the basis for the left null space times we have some scaling factors and again we have R of them which will be in the diagonal positions of this uh, sigma matrix and then everything else will be zero. And then we have the V transpose and V is actually a basis for the input space Rn. So V transpose is also n by n and in V transpose the first R rows are going to be the basis for the row space and the next n minus R rows are going to be the basis for the null, null space. Now if you look at it once more you can see that the scaling factors are non-zero only in this region. So when you multiply this by this the bottom n minus r guys are going to be multiplied by zeros so that will not really give you anything similarly the left m minus r guys here are going to be multiplied by the zeros here so that also will not give you anything so we can actually write the economic version of svd by just considering the hat part u hat sigma hat and uh, v hat transpose so that's what i wrote here whatever i have here those zeros will kill the basis for the, the null space and the left null space so that part is not that critical. Vectors in the columns of V 
are called the right singular vectors and these are the left singular vectors so we can ignore the null space here and the null space here that is uh, the full SVD or the, the smaller economic version of SVD both are accurate okay now let's look at uh, the significance of uh, SVD so it is used in data compression much like the spectral theorem remember we when we could write a as a q lambda q transpose we could write it out as a sum of a series of matrices similarly we can do it here also we have u and uh, ui coming from u and then v transpose so vi transpose coming from that so ui vi transpose the size of uh, that matrix that's a matrix it's a vector times a uh, transpose of uh, another vector that that size is uh, going to be the same as uh, the size of a and then whatever comes out of uh, the sigma hat which will be just uh, just a scaling factor sigma i so that is a summation of matrices of the kind ui vi transpose those are of the same size as uh, a and then there are r of them because the dimension of uh, the row space and the column space is r and uh, the so is the size of a uh, sigma matrix is r by r so if you think about uh, the u vector that is in m by one so m rows and uh, one column the v vector is uh, actually in uh, n by one but v transpose so they should be transpose that would be in one by n so one and one will cancel then you get m by n which is the size of uh, the matrix that you started with so it's a rank one matrix because it's coming out of uh, the linear combination of this one vector weighted by the, the weighting factors in the other vector okay so it's a rank one matrix so it's a rank one approximation so if you take the first guy out of this uh, series of r matrices that is a rank one approximation typically in svd we arrange the singular values in decreasing order so sigma one is going to be greater than sigma two it's going to be greater than sigma three etc so the first one in this uh, summation is going to be the most important rank one matrix that uh, a decomposes into so if you just take the first one you get an approximation for a it may not be a very good approximation if not you can just take the second one also and if that's not good enough then you take the third one and if you take the first few at some point you're going to be happy with the kind of approximation you got for the matrix a and that would be a much smaller set of matrices to store i'll tell you why so let's look at the storage requirement let's say a is a thousand by thousand matrix and a will take one million bytes of storage but if you take a rank one approximation you will have a 100 elements we will have 100 elements and sigma is just one element so that is 201 so rank one approximation of that guy will be just 201 compared to 1 million and if rank one is not good enough the first one is not good enough so you take the first 10 of them so 10 of them will be 2010 so 2000 instead of 1 million that is a still a huge saving so storage as you can compute here instead of m times n the size of the original matrix you need only m plus n plus 1 per term i mean so if you take k of them so k times that number so it's a much smaller number so this is a data compression algorithm but just recently uh, while i was writing this book i wanted to see if it was still being used and i found a paper that was written in 2017 i referred to it in the textbook that actually uses svd for image compression the second one is much more important in terms of uh, data science which is the principal component analysis take any matrix data matrix m by n typically m is a much larger than n because many more observations than, than variables if you take uh, the mean of each column and subtract it from each element of the column then that is called zero centering the data that means the data now in each column will have a mean of zero because you just subtract it out and after that if you take a transpose a the dam matrix that is going to be proportional to the covariance in the data if you just write it out you will see that is actually the expression for the covariance because you're subtracting the mean then that is covariance times the number of observations now if you do the evd of uh, a transpose a which is the same as the svd of a singular value decomposition of a remember is the eigenvalue decomposition of a transpose a then that gives you the linear combinations of the columns that will preserve the largest amount of variance is the first approximation and the second one will give you the second largest amount of variance so that gives you a handle on the variance of the data 
coming from uh, different linear combinations of the variables. And if you want to capture only a certain amount of variance, let's say you want to capture 90% of the variance in the data and build a model out of that, then you might need out of, uh, let's say, 100 uh, features that you have, you might need only the first uh, seven of them or first 15 of them. So instead of 100 features, you might have only seven or 15 features that you need to work with and that will capture 90% or 95% of the, the variance which exactly how much SVD will tell you. This is just the sum of the singular values divided by singular values up to the number k 7 or 15 that you're thinking about divided by the sum of all the singular values up to r which is the rank of the matrix which is going to be the same as the number of columns actually. That fraction will give you the maximum amount of variance that you can capture in your model. That gives you an upper limit of uh, what they call the coefficient of determination. If you remember from uh, statistics, coefficient of determination R square is a fraction of the variance that your model explains in the data. So that and upper limit of that is given by the SVD if you're taking, if you're doing a, a dimensionality reduction or feature engineering. And that is a powerful technique that is used in all, almost all data science projects at the, as the initial stage. So you don't want to deal with 100 features, you want to deal with only 15 linear combinations of them. Those are the engineer features and that might be good enough and that might actually be better because it is possible that the linear combinations corresponding to small values of sigma are actually just noise and maybe you actually want to get rid of them. So doing this this uh, selection of the most significant or the principal components of the data might actually give you a better model because you are improving the the signal to noise ratio in your data. You are doing something like uh, a low pass filtering. Okay, so that is a principal component analysis and how it is done and with an example is there in the textbook. This is something that you should look at. It is going to be useful. It is one of the principal applications of SPV and it is in fact the starting point of many books on uh, data science. Actually, there is a book that I refer to. That book actually starts as the first chapter, Principal Component Analysis or SVD, I think. And that is it. And that is the mathematical foundation of uh, data science. So a couple of more words about this principal components. You have a huge data matrix. You want the most important part. The most important is the principal part. So what are the principal components of the matrix? And those, the most important principal component will be the rank one approximation of the matrix. That is in our decomposition of A, a as the sigma as a summation of a series of matrices based on SVD is the first one okay and if you take the first k of them that will give you a very good approximation of the data and it might actually kill it might improve the signal to noise ratio because you might what you're ignoring might actually be more like noise rather than data so let me actually summarize principal component analysis we haven't gone into the details of it it's a, it's a deep field every single topic subtopic in uh, the last couple of weeks is actually a deep field it's a portal to something that is a uh, fairly deep and rich. So principal directions are the vectors, the right singular vectors V and the components, the principal components in the data are projections along the principal directions, which are actually linear combinations of the columns of uh, A taking V as the weighting factor. So V, the vectors VI in V is called the loading because those are the weighting factors, the scalars that will scale the columns of A to give you the principal component, the second principal component, etc. So that is the loading and AV or AV1, AV2, those are the principal components. And that by our equation, AV is equal to U sigma. So you can come at it from the other side also and see the weight of that principal component by the fraction of the variance that it is capturing in terms of sigma 1 divided by the sum of sigmas. And that is all about principal components and principal directions. So the product of singular values, much like the product of eigenvalues, is the determinant of the matrix. That is also easy to prove using the fact that the product, the determinant of a product is a product of the determinants. So A is a decomposition. So there's a product of uh, three matrices. The so determinant of A is a product of the determinant of the three matrices but u and v are orthonormal uh, matrices so their determinants are going to be one so it's the determinant of a is going to be the determinant of uh, the singular values matrix but the determinant of singular value matrix that being diagonal matrix it's a product of the diagonals of course this applies only to square matrix a because you cannot take the determinant unless it is square so we haven't actually we never really proved that the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinants of those matrices the determinant of a b is a determinant times B determinant. That proof is not trivial. I think that is a bit involved. So uh, another one for a two by two matrix, but there is one more thing. 
the singular values are going to bracket the eigenvalues. Now let's take a step back and look at uh, left and right inverses. You have your matrix is a square matrix and it's got full rank. Then you can invert it. It's an invertible matrix, it's not a singular matrix. And there is an inverse and that inverse can be multiplied on the left or on the right. What I mean is this. If it is a full rank ma matrix, then the inverse exists. That is A inverse. A inverse times A or A times A inverse will both be equal to identity matrix. So A inverse is a real double sided inverse so that's what we have but if it is a full column rank matrix it's not a square matrix it doesn't have an inverse but if it is a full column rank matrix then we know that all columns are linearly independent the rank is n because n linearly independent uh, columns and it's got more rows than columns and if you consider a transpose a that matrix is going to be a smaller matrix because n is much smaller and a transpose a will have the size n by n but a transpose a is a full rank matrix because it's got a rank n and its size is n by n so it's a full rank matrix so a transpose a has an inverse so i can write a transpose a inverse times a transpose a is equal to i and after that if i look at it and i say that this much multiplying a on the left is giving me i so whatever i have there on the left that is the left inverse so that is how you would kind of derive left inverse whenever you need it and if you have full row rank which is like the transpose case of a full column rank then it has a right inverse all the the rows are linearly independent and the rank is a number of linearly independent rows which is m a a transpose is going to have size m by m and then you can do this you can say a, a transpose times a a transpose inverse is equal to i so this much the green part that becomes the right inverse so that is just a recap of uh, left and right inverse and real full inverse also now this is for matrices that are full rank square matrix full column rank or full row rank well, what happens if it is a general matrix which doesn't have full column rank or full row rank it is just a matrix so what you do there what you do there is the pseudo inverse and so the pseudo inverse will kind of reduce to a normal inverse if it is a full rank square matrix will reduce to a, a left inverse if it is a full column rank and if it is full row rank will reduce to the the right inverse so there is a pseudo inverse and that also you get from uh, svd so that definition of a pseudo inverse is when it is rank deficient and it is not square either so here we cannot really get anything like an identity matrix so we're going to manage our expectations so we're going to define a pseudo inverse a plus that is a definition we're not looking for a times a plus equal to i that we cannot have so we will say something more modest like a times a plus a that is equal to a so a something multiplying a gives you a so this is like the identity matrix but it's not quite the identity matrix similarly i have another one a plus a times a plus and that has uh, that gives me a plus also so that's another requirement that is another requirement and then we require that a plus a and a a plus they should be symmetric okay so these these guys are symmetric after having these requirements after finding some a plus that uh, satisfies these requirements then we have we can go back and look at our favorite equation ax equal to b now what we know is that for a b that is non zero the x will be in the row space that we know if you solve it and we have some x and some b and if b is non zero then we know that uh, x is going to be in the row space so it's a mapping from the row space to the column space now if you multiply this guy with a a plus you know that a a plus a is equal to just a that is our first requirement here so we will get a x is equal to this guy what it means is that a a plus b is equal to b because what what do we have i have a x is equal to this guy and a x is also equal to b so a x equal to b that is what we started from but what we have from the other side is that a times a plus b is equal to the same thing but let's see what it is actually saying so what it is saying is that a plus b takes the place of x so for a non-zero b a plus b is in the row space of a so a plus is actually a mapping from the column space remember b is in the column space and a plus b is in the row space so it's a mapping it takes b in the column space and gives you something in the row space so it's what it is doing is actually inverting the transformation ax equal to b but specifically within 
the row space and the column space. Everything in the row space goes to the column space in the one-to-one, onto -one fashion. So it can be in inverted within that confines. So A plus is the guy that actually does it. A plus takes vectors in uh, the column space, gives you vectors, a unique vector for each one of the unique vectors in uh, in the column space, gives you a unique vector in the row space. Okay, so it is like the the inverse but confined to the column space and row space where you can actually do the inverse. This is the best you can do. You cannot do better than this. So let me summarize that in that box there. A plus is a mapping from Rm, which is the core domain, the output space, to Rn, which is the domain, the input space, such that A plus B is actually X for every B that is a member of the column space of A. So that pseudo inverse actually does the best we could possibly do with a very general matrix which doesn't have full rank, etc. This is the best you can do. And computation of this guy actually comes from SVD. So we can actually do this uh, computation. We have SVD right there. And if you take the pseudo inverse, we will get the you remember when you take the inverse it actually goes in the opposite direction so you're going to take the inverse of u that becomes u transpose inverse of v transpose that becomes v and then we're going to take the sigma matrix and we're going to take the reciprocals wherever we have a number and if it is zero we're just going to leave it as zero so that's the definition of the pseudo inverse this is uh, using the full svd and we can actually do the same thing using the economic version of uh, SVD, the smaller version of SVD, which is actually a bit easier to understand. The most important part is that it takes is a mapping from the output space back to the input space. So that kind of completes the symmetry that you have among the four fun fundamental subspaces of the matrix. So let me show that to you. So we started quite a while ago with general matrices of uh, M rows and N columns, R, M by N, with the rank R which may be smaller than M and N. So that is a general case. And that is actually a mapping from Rn to Rm. Rn is the domain where the vectors of the kind X live and Rm is the codomain or the output space where vectors of the kind B will live. So it's a mapping from Rn to Rm. And we have the row space and the column space. Every single vector in the row space will go to a unique vector in the column space through the application Ax equal to B. It's a linear combination of the columns of A and all such linear combinations are in the column space. And what by doing SVD, we could find a special basis in the row space, an orthonormal basis, which will transform to a special basis in the column space, an orthonormal basis there. Of course, if you have a zero vector, which will be a part of the row space and column space and all such all spaces, that will of course go to the zero vector because a times zero is always zero. But what is a bit more interesting is that everything in the null space will also go to the zero vector on the output side. Zero vector is a part of the column space also. There is a left null space so we've accounted for all the dimensions in the input side they all go somewhere in the column space but there are other vectors so if the row space is the xy plane and the null space is the z axis there are many more vectors in r3 and those are all uh, linear combinations of uh, vectors in the row space and the null space but in order to complete the story of the dimensions in the input side in the domain we have r basis vectors in the row space the right singular vectors vi's from v1 to vr and the rest of them are actually in the null space and that there will be n minus r of them because that is the dimension of the null space. Similarly, there is some, there are some new vectors that will complete the basis on the output side. And what I was just telling you is that most of the vectors that are not in the, no, the row space or the null space, those are most of the vectors in the input side. They are not in the xy plane or the z axis, but they'll be somewhere else. All those guys will actually end up in the column space. The important part is that everything that is in the row space goes to the column space in the unique fashion. There is a one-to-one -one mapping so that can be inverted and that inversion is done by uh, a plus which is the pseudo inverse so that will take all the vectors in the column space back to the row space and of course the zero vector will go to the zero vector and everything in the null space by the action of the pseudo inverse will go to the zero vector too and most vectors on the output side are neither in the column space nor in the left null space and they will end up in the row space by the action of uh, a plus the pseudo inverse so that completes the symmetry if you look at this picture to me this is the most beautiful picture that i've shown you in the textbook in this course this is completely symmetric this is the summary of almost everything that we did in this course today what we learned we described 
SVD and how it works and its properties and applications. We saw that eigenvalue decomposition had some limitations that it applied only to square matrices. And if you really want to be precise about it, good eigenvalue decompositions could be obtained only for real and symmetric matrices. SVD kind of does away with that limitation and it can apply to any matrix. It doesn't have to be symmetric, it doesn't even have to be square. So it applies to data matrices. And what we will get is a basis for the, the input side, which will be the right singular vectors which will be in v so that will be a basis for the row space and the basis for the null space union the union of those two basis vectors i should say and that will be the basis for the input space the domain and then we have scaling factors that would be a diagonal matrix and that matrix will have the same size as uh, a so the main diagonal the leading diagonal will have singular values and how many of them will there be you will have as many non-zero values there as the rank of the matrix. It is uh, sorted descending, so the first one is the most important one. That kind of tells you the importance of that combination of the singular vectors on the left and on the right in, in as a component of the matrix that you're looking at. So it's a decomposition of the matrix as a series uh, sum, uh, each one of them being a rank one matrix, and also is a decomposition in terms as a product. So you would be the collection of the left singular vectors, and that would be a basis for the column space and the left null space union together that will give you a basis for the the output space where vectors of the kind b in a x equal to b live and if you're thinking of only the basis for the row space then that would be v hat and only the basis for the column space that would be u hat so svd is used in data compression using rank k approximation that means take the first k rank one matrices and that will lead to some saving in the in the storage requirement and then it's used in a pca principal component analysis a very important application of a spd so then we talked about principal component analysis in a couple of slides we know its significance now in data science because it leads to dimensionality reduction feature engineering and that is very very important and pca is the eigenvalue decomposition of the covariance matrix and the covariance matrix is actually just the gram matrix after doing the zero centering then we went on to the pseudo inverse purely for its uh, beauty and elegance of how it completes the four fundamental subspaces of the matrix there we saw the symmetry of uh, the whole of a linear algebra and this is the general inverse that will take you from from the column space back to the row space so that completes the symmetry and that in my view was a very beautiful picture and that's the reason why it appears on the cover page of the textbook now it's time to take a look at uh, how we got here so we started way back with the basic idea of linearity linearity is about scaling something and expecting to see the same scaling on the output side and we wanted to extend that from one number to multiple numbers so we defined the concept of vectors as a bunch of numbers standing in a in a column so that you can scale all of them by the same factor in tandem at the same time and then we extended that to a table of numbers and called it a matrix so that we could write uh, systems of linear equations as a matrix equation uh, at the same time we defined the basic operations like uh, scaling and uh, addition and the fact that they are all closed and then doing both of them together taking linear combinations all those things came about in the first couple of weeks then now that we have the matrix equation we started worrying about solving the equations the systems of linear equations and we call that the algebraic view of uh, linear algebra there we saw draw elimination techniques like gaussian elimination gauss Jordan elimination gaussian elimination gave you pivots and the number of pivots was actually the rank of the matrix and gauss Jordan elimination gave you the inverses inverses which would be basically like normalizing the pivots and back substituting so that you get everything other than the pivot in a column to be zero and that basically works on the matrix to give you its inverse and we commented on the solvability of uh, equations we did quite a bit of work there and after that we expanded our view to something more sophisticated like the geometric view there we saw vector spaces as collections of vectors with the closure properties and then we said that subspaces were subsets of these uh, collections that had the same closure properties and then we kind of looked at a vector at a, at a matrix and realize that the columns of the matrix are just vectors standing there and subspaces are just spans of vectors so a matrix would give you naturally some subspaces and they have some properties very interesting properties at that so we looked at those in some detail and then we said something that is a uh, quite remarkable
remarkable. We said if we could project a vector to the column space of a matrix, we could find the approximate or the best possible solution to a system of linear equations when there is no real solution. And that led us to least square minimization and linear regression. And that was kind of like the, the crowd jewel of our uh, work in the geometric view of, uh, of uh, linear algebra because we could see the applicability of our work in linear algebra giving you a real algorithm that is extremely widely used exactly the way we describe it in the class. After that we moved on to more advanced topics all of them actually extremely important eigenvalue decomposition used everywhere in physical sciences and also in uh, in computer science in its usage as uh, part of a uh, singular value decomposition. In order to take care of the limitations of eigenvalue decomposition we did singular value decomposition a general way of decomposing a matrix extremely widely used in data science and computer science so much so that it could be the starting point of mathematical exploration in computer science, not the ending point of a course. We also looked at some of the algorithms to compute eigenvalues, eigenvectors, etc. And from the theoretical side, we looked at uh, Jordan forms, Jordan matrix, even though these things are just theoretical or mathematical in nature, they also have applications in algorithms in such a way that I believe the pseudo inverses are computed using something to do with Jordan matrices and Jordan forms. Uh, I don't know exactly how, but uh, I believe that is the case and uh, that is a much more efficient algorithm apparently. So that's all we did in this course. Now, in addition to our focus, our main focus, that is from the, the perspective of computer science, we also did a little bit of, uh, of uh, mathematical explorations. We didn't shy away from uh, mathematical kind of explorations because that the book of nature is actually written in the language of mathematics, which if you think about it is the reason why machine learning algorithms actually work. Why would there be any reason for mathematics to be able to make predictions of nature, which is what you do in uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence? Why would it have any relevance? Because nature is written in the language of mathematics and these are the basics that you learn here the grammar, the words, and the alphabet. These are the basics. I'm giving you some part of the, of the language. And in order to enjoy and appreciate the beauty of uh, nature, you probably need some mathematical language. And this is part of that. But mostly we focused on computer science. Okay, so that completes our journey in linear algebra for computer science.